Hi, I'm Duewa Frazier, and you're listening to episode 42 of Nerdocity Podcast. And today my guest is award-winning author, poet, and children's writer, Naomi Shihab Nye. She is the author and or editor of more than 30 volumes. Naomi's books of poetry include 19 varieties of gazelle, poems of the Middle East, Amazed for Me, Poems for Girls, Red Suitcase, Words Under the Words, Fuel, and You and Yours. She is also the author of Mint Snowball, Never in a Hurry, I'll Ask You Three Times, Are You Okay?, Tales of Driving and Being Driven, Essays, Habibi and Going Going, Novels for Young Readers, Baby Radar, City Secrets, and Famous Picture Book. And also, there is No Long Distance Now, a collection of very short stories. Her other works include the most recent, favorably reviewed title for young readers, Turtle of Michigan, and also Time You Let Me In, This Same Sky, The Space Between Our Footsteps, Poets and Paintings from the Middle East, What Have You Lost, and Transfer. Her collection of poems for young adults entitled Honey Bee won the 2008 Arab American Book Award in the children's young adult category. Her novel for children, The Turtle of Oman, was chosen both as a best book of 2014 by the Horn Book and a 2015 notable children's book by the American Library Association. The Turtle of Oman was also awarded the 2015 Middle East Book Award for Youth Literature. Naomi was named Young People's Poet Laureate by the Poetry Foundation, a title that she still holds in 2022. She was awarded the 2019 Lon Tickle Award by the Texas Institute of Letters and elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. Naomi's most recent books are Voices in the Air, Poems for Listeners, and The Tiny Journalists, in addition to The Turtle of Michigan. Thank you for listening. Greetings, Naomi. Hello, Duewa. I'm so happy to be with you. Oh, thank you so much. This is such a treat for me, and I'm sure for many, many listeners as well. I got a lot of likes uh, on the social media when I posted your your interview. So I'm sure people are really looking forward to it. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, I am honored to talk with you and thanks for inviting me. Oh, for sure. And so Naomi, I really wanna congratulate you on your latest book, uh, your new release, The Turtle of Michigan, uh, which was released in uh, March uh, of this year. Is that correct? That's right. I'm so happy it's out. That's wonderful. And this title uh, for young readers is the follow-up uh, for your previous title, The Turtle of Oman, and that was released in 2016. Well, it or, was, I think it was 20, yes, maybe 2016, maybe it 2014. Was, oh, okay. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I'm not, I'm not even sure. Maybe Maybe we're thinking of the paperback, but at any yes. rate, um, yes, that's right. 2014 was the hardback, then 2016, the paperback. Okay, I was right. thinking of paperback. Okay, yes. you know, I, I'm, this book. I vote for paperback. <laughs> you know, I love it. Um, just the the very uh, dialogue in it, uh, and a ref's journey, uh, his family, uh, as well as the poetry and the and the creative. Um, uh, detail in this book. It gives a lot of visualization for the reader. Um, and it's very, it's just a really relaxing read. Um, just tell me, how uh, was it to craft this follow up to your previous title, uh, The Turtle of Oman? I love that you use the word relaxing because I think that's an important word to keep with us when we read. Sometimes we don't always need everything to be overly stimulating and um, full of drama, melodrama. I wanted to write a quiet book, but I wanted it to have 
a texture of daily life, which in some ways um, reminds me of all my writing. Mm. Uh, I don't like too much drama in life or in writing. <laughs> and uh, I like when things are sort of rolling along at a calm pace. And because this book was uh, not only invited, but sort of demanded by kids who read The Turtle of Oman, they really wanted to know what happened to Aref uh, after he came to the United States. Mm. And it wasn't just one kid bugging me. It was quite a few kids. <laughs> well, and wow. I was so touched by that, that they would care enough to want to follow mm. a character that I made a promise to them that I would try to do it. And uh, a good portion of The Turtle of Michigan was written during that first year of COVID that we all shared in the world. Yes. That very scary year. And there was a lot of drama and anxiety in that year. And I found that somehow working on this story was uh, very calming to me, just carrying on with the little boy character and mm -hmm. his family and thinking a lot about what makes home, mm. what makes us feel at home. How long does it take to feel at home? What's the first thing we do when we get home? Mm -hmm. And when we were living through COVID and not going out much in the world, I do feel that we all probably had changed relationships with our homes. Mm. Um, yeah, we just looked at things differently. We cleaned different corners. We, you know, went through the spice drawer we figured out kind of where we were living in a deeper, slower way because we weren't running around traveling in the world and so forth. So life changed as I was writing the book, but we decided not to put COVID in the book. Although in the first draft, I did include COVID. I mean, COVID came around and Adif had to experience it in his sure. new place. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think my editor, whom I, I love very much, named Virginia Duncan, mm -hmm. I think she felt in some ways that might date the book too much. Yes. And, mm. and hold it, you know, to 2020. 2020, and, right. Right. And maybe we didn't want it to be pinned by something that was, you know, so hard for everyone. True. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote it. I felt very comforted by writing it and I was surprised by what happened in it because I admit I didn't know when I started the book you know everything that was going to happen I didn't really know anything that was going to happen mm -hmm. so uh, but I did know the characters that was the difference yes. when I when I started the turtle of Oman I really had to get to know the characters but by the time I got into the turtle of Michigan I knew the characters and it was the story I had to find yes indeed and i love the um the details that uh are so revealing for culture a different culture that children uh, may not normally experience whether it was the moroccan food or the mentions of uh arabic language um right that gives it a lot more of a, a feel that you are learning something new. You're, you're, right. you're, you're close to something familiar, but then you're also, you know, getting into a different um, world or, or culture. And I think that's really great for children. I love the way you describe that because that would be my best dream that you could have some unfamiliar elements, some, some tinges of the exotic, some different flavors, multicultural mixing, mm -hmm. but still there's a familiar quality like, oh yeah, these, these seem like people I know, or they're, yes. they're, they're behaving <laughs> in a way that makes human sense to me. And, um, you know, because I grew up in a bicultural household and my friends would say things to me like, is your father really an Arab? And I would think, well, he doesn't see, like, I don't even know what that means, really. Because he's <laughs> right. just my dad. He's just my father. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't know a lot of Arabs. So I would say he's, he's my dad. And, and then they would want to talk to him about, you know, his background, his culture. 
And, um, and he was the only Arab, by the way, in the, in the community where, where we lived. So kids were interested in him. Even adults were interested in him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that, that was a quality to childhood that, that intrigued me, like how people had, had, um, you know, different cultures, but we were all human beings and we could share our differences. Like my best friend spoke French at home with her family because they were French Canadian, mm -hmm. but I knew her as an English speaker. So when I would go to their home and hear them all speaking in French, I would think, wow, this is so amazing. <laughs> and, and they all know what they're saying and I have no idea what they're talking about. But, you know, there was a sense of um, acceptance and joy in that, in that mixtures of cultures. And so I wanted Aref to be a boy coming from the Middle East to live in Michigan, but be surprised that he feels so quickly at home that people mm -hmm. welcome him in the ways they do. And then he meets other kids of all different backgrounds and they're all just kids. And, and they're all just kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're all just kids. And, you know, uh, you and I were talking a little bit before we started today about just the sorrows in the world and how we're living at a time where um, tragedies, distinctions made between people keep causing or keep being, you know, singled out as, as connected to violent uh, behaviors. The war uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Um, I have mm -hmm. a close friend who's half Ukrainian, half Russia. He's high. Russian, he's highly traumatized. Wow. Because it's like, mm. how can half of me be fighting, be fighting the, other the other half, half of, me? of me? And mm. I understand that that feeling. And and you know, in our own country, the many, many mixtures of of cultures. I live in a 63% Latino city and I treasure it. I love it. And I feel, you know, that even though I'm not Latina, mm -hmm. I have never been disqualified from living here. And uh, and I feel so much grief for people at the border only two hours from me, mm. you know, what they're going through. And we just see this, you know, all over our world, this drama, the trauma mm -hmm. um, in the streets and in, in the communities that separate people. So I wanted to write a book in which the mixtures connect people, mm. don't separate them. So important. Wow, that's powerful and so needed for this time. Um, do you find that the children who are really drawn to your work, is it, do you think by referral from uh, mostly teachers, parents, librarians? Um, well, I don't know, but if any teachers or librarians who are listening ever recommend my work, I deeply thank you. And parents too. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, it's hard to know how how uh, kids come upon uh, upon their reading matter these days. Uh -huh. I was very happy with the Turtle of Oman that it was selected for a program in North Carolina called Little Read, which is sponsored through Lenore Ryan University in Hickory, North Carolina. And so uh -huh. A large numbers of kids, we're talking thousands, were given copies of the Turtle of Oman wow. free as a little read read book. And, you know, they got to keep it. It was their own book. And then I got to go and meet thousands of them over a three day period. And um, and we all together watched a play that was made from the book. It was actually turned into a stage play. Wow. Jonathan <laughs> Ray. And it was so phenomenal. It used people from the community um, to play all the parts, none of whom were Arabs, but they did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just such a beautiful shared community experience. And I knew that a lot of these kids were coming from, very small North Carolinian towns. And the teachers told me, because I met with teachers too, that, you know, a lot of kids had never met an Arab person, mm -hmm. but they had no problems with looking at Araf as a fellow human. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. a boy who worries like we worry, mm -hmm. or a boy who resists change as we often all resist change That's at right. any age. And, you know, the first school that I ever went to in San Antonio, where I live, 
where I'm speaking from, um, it was like a third or fourth grade class and they had all been assigned the Turtle of Oman. And when I got there, it was so interesting to talk to them because they really wanted to talk about how none of them had moved from country to country within that particular class. But mm -hmm. they said, but we've all moved from grade to grade. Grade to grade. And mm. they said, people don't understand how hard that is. Mm. Our, our parents didn't understand. You know, the teachers don't seem to understand. It's really hard to change grades. And they were amazing. They really opened my mind because I really didn't think of that as such a huge change. Right. You know, I thought, well, you're going with the people you already know. Yeah, you already school. know. Yeah, you're in the same school hallway. And they said, no, we're not. We're changing hallways. Oh, and wow. And we don't want to. We don't want to go to that other wing of the school and be with the bigger kids. And it was like a really big deal oh to them. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was toward the end of school. And they were all like clinging on to their third grade teacher. They did not want to change to sure. fourth grade. So. That opened my mind to think about, you know, there are so many changes we forget about as we mm -hmm. grow up. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, that was hard. You know, I do remember in, after second grade, my best French speaking friend moved back to Quebec, Canada. And I, it, I was broken hearted. I thought, how can I how can I go to third grade without my best friend? It's terrible. And, and I remember writing. I was already writing poems at that age, writing mm -hmm. poems about her writing lists of things that made her memorable to me or stand wow. out from all the other girls, why I loved her so much. And thinking that if I write this down, I, maybe I'll remember it better. And by the way, guess what? We're still friends. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. All these years <laughs> later. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> we're both grandmothers and we're still friends. Oh, yeah. wow. That's yeah. Very wow. special. You're like living your your stories yeah. or what would you say? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, because your main character makes lists too. Yes. Um, there he does. Some he lists. Makes, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. He is a list maker. His father is a list maker. And you know, I always kid well, often encourage kids to make their own lists. Like at the end of the day, write down three things in a notebook that you'd like to remember from this day or three things you saw or tasted or heard or wondered about, three questions you asked, three things that stood out to you from your whole day. And if you do that, just think at the end of a month, you have 90 things that belong to you that wow. came out of your month that <laughs> didn't take any time at all. And you have a very rich notebook already. And I think kids are very intrigued when you sort of lure them into the realm of writing by showing them ways they can apply it to themselves mm -hmm. and it will help them have a better life and help them remember more and just be a more observant person. I think kids really like that. They, they appreciate it. I mean, they may not act like it at first when you give them an assignment, but ultimately I know they do. Wow. That's so true. You know, kids need it to be relevant to them, their real lives and yeah. who they are inside. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, we, we often think of writing as something we do when, when we have, you know, a big historic moment in our lives or, you know, a big drama or, or a huge turning point. Mm -hmm. But I also think of it as something that helps us stay tuned to the regular days, the quiet days, the little things. And I think that's what we need to feel enriched um, within our own experience. Wow. And, you know, Naomi, um, you've been a children's writer for a long time. In addition to being a poet, you're so prolific. Um, you were named the Young People's Poet Laureate from, uh, I believe, 2019 to 2021. Is that correct? Well, actually, I'm still carrying the title oh, because okay. they, they haven't appointed <laughs> anyone else yet. But yes. I will be carrying it, I think, until next fall now. And because of COVID and because a lot of my trips had to go virtual, mm -hmm. um, they extended my my position another year. And now it's been extended a little longer. So I love it. I mean, it's it's really doing what I did all my life, which is work with kids, work with teachers, 
um, talk about writing and talk about poetry. And it's been a total joy. I get to pick a book every month that is kind of my book of the month that goes mm -hmm. on to the Poetry Foundation oh, yeah. uh, website. And if anyone puts my name into Poetry Foundation and goes YPPL, Young People's Poet Laureate, you can scroll back through all my book pecs of the last three years. And many of them are books that would really help teachers introduce poetry in their classrooms or share it with kids of all ages or just enjoy it themselves. And for my last few months, I think I'm going to pick some books I really like by individual authors just to um, just to do something a little different than what I did already on their book picks. But it's been a pleasure and I've you know gotten to, to meet a lot of people through through Zoom. And through podcasts and through all the ways we meet one another these days. Yes, that's true. And so I bet yeah. that was a real treat, um, you know, for the children to see you, uh, different students um, to see you and, and um, you're um, reading poetry to them and talking with them about different um, texts. Is that is that correct? I, yes, I hope I hope it has been. Well, usually we were talking about their own texts. I was encouraging them to look at, look at ways to find and feel more poetry in their own lives. And I was also sharing uh, poems, you know, by other people, not so much always by myself with the workshops I did, but by other people, poems that I thought they would like that would help encourage their own writing. I remember one time in the middle of COVID lockdown days, I was working with a bunch of junior high kids in California and um, we ended up that day, everybody just writing about what they saw outside their windows. Mm. And I saw some of the best poems about looking down on the rooftops of cars, on parking lots, on dumpsters, on, you know, things that didn't seem so glamorous. But that's what these kids had been looking at and keeping their eyes on out their windows in the days when they couldn't go so many places. And I remember we also did a writing that day, something they remembered eating um, when they were not in their home, someplace mm, that mm -hmm. they had never forgotten. And that day we got beautiful poems about like my grandmother's Guatemalan rice and the mm. enchiladas in Mexico that are different from the enchiladas in California and just all these savory food poems that were really sweet. And, you know, we, we just talked a lot over these past few years about how memory keeps sustaining us even when we're feeling trapped. Wow. That's you know, powerful. It was powerful. Mm. And I felt that day after I got off Zoom, like I just wanted to sit on, at my desk and, and cry a little bit for all of the all of the stimulation out in the world that kids were being denied. Mm. And, um, you know, it was just so, so hard to think of kids who were in the prime of their kidness wanting to be with <laughs> each other, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it was as hard for older people as it was for, for the kids. Children. And I, I think kids were so brave and so valiant. And, um, you know, I got to observe a little one, a four, he was four when COVID started. He's six now and mm -hmm. he's in kindergarten now. And he actually went to preschool on Zoom. Wow. And, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, and it was hard too. He, he sure. sometimes <laughs> did it from my house and I would think, what in the world are they talking about? They would, be, <laughs> they would be talking about like coding and all this computer stuff. And I would uh -huh. think he's only, he's, he's only, only four. four. Give him a break. <laughs> I don't know how to do this stuff. And he's lived the stress of a, a full-grown yeah. adult in the last few yeah. years. <laughs> and, you know, one thing I noticed about him was, and this, I would just like to, just like to hug all the kids in the world who did not complain as much as they might have. But I noticed he has never once complained about wearing a mask. Wow. Never once. Mm, not mm, once. Mm. Not yeah. once. Mm. Not once. No. So he's interesting. He's worn it this whole kindergarten year, too, because all the kids uh, in his class, or at least most of them, are still wearing masks. So, yeah. Yeah. And didn't complain once about it. Not mm. once. Never heard a word of complaint. Wow. Yeah. Think about how many complaints we heard out of grownups. 
Oh, planning. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, yeah. had whole protests over it. So. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> I just rode on some airplanes and it was like, why do I have to sit next to these unmasked jokers? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, I know. and they, yeah, it's, it's made oh, the news about our, our adult behavior. <laughs> yes, it has. So that's why I like to be in the world of children. I mean, I like yeah. to be around children. I like to think of how they see the world. I adore their perspectives. Um, and so Arif, you know, he is a character that I think about. I mean, I miss him. I, I see things in the world and I think, oh, Arif would really like that. Wow. I, I take a walk down by the river by our house and, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of turtles in there and I'll see some poke their heads up and I just think about him first. Um, and by the way, we did have a turtle who lived in our yard for 16 years. So I'm quite familiar with and then I think he went he he got out once when a carpenter mm -hmm. left the gate open oh. I, think, I think he went and jumped in the river after all that time wow uh, and by the way I'm <laughs> saying he but, but it was really a she because she laid some eggs before oh. she left and <laughs> okay. so we realized we'd been calling her the wrong gender for oh, 16 years okay <laughs> but but um, I think she was at the age where she wanted some friends so she mm -hmm. took off and uh you know, I just respect turtles. And I also respect um, how kids love turtles. You know, they're just fascinated by them. True. And and they are incredible creatures. Mm. Yeah. But I also think of Adif as sort of being the turtle of the books. I mean, and, he's, mm -hmm. yeah, he's, he's slow in the first book in terms of not wanting to pack for his journey. Mm -hmm. And then in the second book, he's like slow and really coming to grips with this possible turtle he might or might not have as a pet and then you know I respect his decision a lot yeah, yeah. And, and do you think that you know just as the the children uh really spoke out to you about the first book and wanting to know you know what happens do you feel the need to continue to kind of grow with um your protagonist and 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 kind of let his life uh, unfold a little more as he gets older no, I don't think I'll be writing about him anymore. I think that I will take leave from him, but I will always be thinking about him. Wow. Because I really, I really like him. Yeah. Um, I, I like his resilience, his spirit. I like his thought patterns. Um, I just, I like the way he talks. And I like how he loves his grandfather and and his life, how he notices details and everything. Mm -hmm. I just really, really like him. But probably I will not write any more turtle books. I just hope the kids who wanted this book like it if they run into it. Yes. I hope they get it and I hope they like it. I'm sure they will. And, you know, Naomi, I also want to congratulate you. I've read some really wonderful reviews um, on the Turtle of Michigan, including yeah. from School Library Journal, um, stating it's a lovely, uh, celebrating, it's a lovely uh, story, celebrating the power of human connections. Um, Kirkus Reviews also had wonderful things to say about the book, um, that it's sensitive and poignant, family-centered uh, take on moving to a new country. Um, and, and I definitely feel like, you know, those are things that readers uh, will really uh, be impacted by and, and, and be glad to know about. Oh, I hope so. And, you know, there is such a, a presence of, of mixed culture everywhere in the world. I've worked at international schools all over the world, and they have, you know, students from everywhere. When I worked at the school in Oman twice, I met more Danish kids than I've ever met in my whole life. Wow. And I said, why are you all living here? And they <laughs> said, well, you know, Denmark is a country that's big on banking and insurance. Mm. And so we have those companies are in the Middle East and that's what our parents work for. And I just said, well, I've never been to Denmark, but my last name, Nye, is Danish from my mm -hmm. husband. Oh. And so I feel really excited to meet so many Danish people <laughs> in the Middle East. It's a big surprise to me. Um, there's a school here in San Antonio I just wanted to mention to you where I think 36 different languages are spoken, um, languages of origin with the kids. Wow. And they no longer use the word refugee to identify kids. Mm -hmm. As my own father was called a Palestinian refugee when 
when uh, when I was a kid, that mm-hmm. word was you know used to apply to him. But this school has decided that refugee is a sad word that yes. focuses on what you've lost. Lost, and mm-hmm. so they call the kids newcomers, oh. which means like people who are new, what you find and how we welcome you. And I love that. Isn't that beautiful? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So Araf is, and and anyway, Araf is not a refugee. To, to begin with, he is he is a lucky child whose parents have not lost their home and whose parents will be able to go back to Oman when they finish their educations. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but I think they probably always believe they'll keep being educated wherever they are. Sure. Yeah. And that's the story of so many families. Um, so many. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I go to visit that school, the kids are so proud and so beautiful. And uh, sometimes I have them write about, you know, their own memories. And I'll never forget a line a girl said to me a couple of years ago. She said, well, my memories live in my mother's phone. <laughs> and I thought, in my mother's phone. That's yeah, because her mother had all the pictures of the home country. Wow. And I thought that is so touching. I mean, it was just such an incredible line. So mm. I told her, use that in your poem. I'm and telling that, you. Yeah. yeah that and it's so my... now, and it, and it really yeah. captures, this is, you know, this the, is where that generation, are. this is where we are. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's where we are, right. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and so, Naomi, you talked a bit about um, the, the fact that, um, or did we, uh, that part of, the story was written during, you know, the early stages of the pandemic yes. and that it was, um, you know, really just uh, calming and uh, for you in, in writing, writing this story and getting into this character. Um, can you talk about any changes, if any, um, that you experienced to your writing life or your creativity in terms of your instinct to be creative during this pandemic? Well, that's a, a lovely question. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I think writers probably had it luckier and easier than other people because we're used to being at home alone writing. I mean, it's not a like a communal art, except for when people are reading your book or if you're out talking about your book or doing a workshop or something. But um, when you create, you know, a book or writing, you're frequently by yourself. So that was not hampered harmed by the the COVID pandemic I was able to be home more and work on the book Um, but I think many of us wrote poems like I know COVID or the whole experience of a virus a lockdown such a collective anxiety that we've all been living with that definitely came out in poems and and flavored uh, other writings that I was doing so I'm sure that um that many people had that experience. Also, I was able to work on a project uh, with two friends of mine, David Hassler and Tyler Meyer, mm-hmm. called Dear Vaccine, which is a brand new anthology that <laughs> just came out, which is writings on the global pandemic. Oh, wow. People, people all over the world. And so I wrote the model poem for that project, which was, uh-huh. you know, as we were all anxiously anticipating the vaccine to be available. Mm-hmm. And then and then people wrote, we encouraged a lot of people to write on a website, which still exists and anyone can write on it any day called DearVaccine.com. Wow. And I hope people will go there and add their own thoughts about their own experiences. And, and um, it's a very beautiful site just to go to and read. You can just go and read other people's writings if you don't feel like writing something yourself. But it's actually turned into a book. So I think a lot of my COVID thinking went into that project and the Turtle of Michigan um, remained without it, you know. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's nice to hear about, um, you know, each writer I've talked to has a different uh, take and experience, whether, you know, hey, this was so great for me to be able to write or their writing took, um, you know, was focused on different themes because of the pandemic and everything happening. Um, So I just love to hear, um, you know, just the creative um, process. Um, 
how it might have been impacted, if at all, um, because we can learn from that, certainly. Yes. Uh, well, I think we can. And I think some people might like to look at the videos. People started sending videos to Dear Vaccine. We have quite a bundle of them on there now where you can just watch someone saying their own piece of writing. And mm -hmm. it's very moving. Um, and that, that sense that we were all learning new things, experiencing new things, maybe not things we wanted to know about at all, but um, here it was and we had to face it. And, right. <laughs> and it wasn't easy. I mean, it just has not been an easy journey for people and so much loss. I mean, I'm very moved by the, the cover of the New York Times today it just says one million. And wow. it's, it's so mm. painful just to have that lying on the table. One million human yes. beings in our country alone. Yeah. And mm. you think about what that signifies. Indeed. So many lives. That's so, so true. Many lives, yes. And, you know, Naomi, I was wondering, um, you did have several uh, poetry collections that came out um, before your uh, recent title, uh, The Turtle of Michigan. I want to say in 2020, um, you had uh, Never in a Hurry, Everything Comes Next, Castaway Poems of Our Time. Um, and so will you be returning to uh, writing poetry collections? Oh, sure. Yes, I am right now. I'm working on a book of poems connected to my mom, who actually died on Thanksgiving. Oh, I'm sorry and, to hear that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, she was, I must say, she was very proud that she never got COVID. Oh, that wow. That was kind of a strange yeah. point of pride. <laughs> and, and actually, she was living with two people who both got COVID oh. at the very beginning of the pandemic. Of the pandemic. And she never got it. And she never got it. <laughs> no, she never got it. Um, so, but she didn't die of COVID. She did not. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I'm working on poems related to her. And, and I really would urge anyone who has had a beloved person die within the past few years mm -hmm. to, to really seriously think about writing to them or about them because it helps you feel as if you're continuing the conversation and you're staying close to them. Wow. Um, but I would love to read a little bit from a chapter in the turtle of Michigan. Oh, would I'm sure. Okay? Yes, please do. Can't, oh, can't wait to hear it. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. So in this, in this little chapter part that I'll read, there are two or th actually three other characters and all their names start with H. I'm just noticing. That's a coincidence. <laughs> a coincidence. There's Hayan, who is another Arab American boy who lives in the apartment complex mm -hmm. where my narrate, my main character, Adif, lives. And there is Hugh, a next door neighbor man, who's uh, an older man, older than their parents, and also is blind. And then there is Hugh's service dog, whose name is Honeybun. Yes. <laughs> And it's called Listening In. Hayan said, if you put your ear against a tree trunk, it would talk to you. He and Adif were standing outside Hugh's apartment where a big maple tree grew. Hugh was sitting in his chair with honey bun curled up beside. Hugh said he believed that. He said honey bun probably did too. Maybe they hold their stories in their bark and their leaves, Hugh said. So Adif snuggled up to the tree trunk and wrapped his arms around it. Hello, he said. No, don't talk, Hayan said. Just listen. You have to be very quiet to hear it. A postal truck paused and rumbled. Some jays flew over, making a loud squawking sound. Hugh laughed. Adif thought he heard the word, yes. He said so. I agree. I think that's what a tree says most often, said Hugh. But why would it say yes? asked Adif. It's happy to be here, said Hugh. Hayan said he usually heard longer sentences, and sometimes they were in Arabic, like a prayer. Adif stared at Hayan. Did you know some bats are no bigger than a human thumb? He asked. Also, have you ever seen a tar? It's a wild goat. We have a sanctuary for them back home. 
He knew he was changing the subject, but he didn't know much about talking trees. Would you boys mind speaking a little Arabic for me? Asked Hugh. I love hearing it. It carries me back to the days when I was young and traveling, walking the streets of great cities like Jeddah and Beirut and Damascus. My grandma lives in Damascus, said Hayan. My dad went to Damascus, said Araf. Walla, said Hayan. And then they started talking in Arabic for Hugh, and he rocked back in his metal chair, smiling. Even Honeybun lifted her head and seemed to like it. So there you have just a little quiet scene, people hanging out in front of their doors mm -hmm. on an afternoon, just chatting about little things. And of course, the boys are interested and they talk to Hugh in Hugh. another chapter mm -hmm. about when and how he went to the Middle East and he had worked there as a young man um, before he lost his sight. And they're quite captivated by his stories his and stories. memories. And yeah, and also the fact that he cooks them all a really, really good dinner. And they learn that even if you don't have visual sight, you can have lots of talent. That's right. All your yeah. other senses coming to live. And that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. that's just wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that excerpt from the Turtle of Michigan, Naomi. Um, please, can you share with us um, where we can best follow your work online? Um, if you have a, new, a next virtual event coming up that we can look out for? Um, oh, that's so kind of you. Well, I will be participating in the San Antonio Book Festival this weekend. And I know that it has a lot of uh, virtual possibilities that people who aren't in San Antonio, Texas could could zoom in on. And uh, you could follow me on Instagram at nshehab2018, uh, wow. which is when I started my Instagram page. So it's just uh, in lowercase n-s-h-i-h-a-b, which was my maiden name, and then 2018. And I really love Instagram because I like taking pictures and I like um, putting just a little, kind of a little quote or comment under a picture. Um, I just really like it. And I guess these days, whatever I place on Instagram goes over to Facebook too. But yeah. I, defi I definitely check um, Instagram much more than Facebook. I admit I don't look at it very much. But thank you for asking. I do sometimes post um, upcoming events on Facebook, but not always. Okay. Well, I'll be sure to, when promoting um, this podcast, mention that you're featuring um, this weekend coming up at San Antonio Book Festival and that there's a virtual um, component for that. So that would be great. Thank you so much. And uh, also people could go to, uh, to YouTube and see an event I did yesterday with a young Arab poet. So that would relate to um, my main character, Araf. This young poet is 31 years old and his oh, name wow. is Mo Mosab Abu Toha. And he is a fantastic poet. And the title of his first book, which is out from City Lights Press in San Francisco, is oh. Things You Might Find Hidden in My Ear. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So yesterday I had the honor of getting to interview him. And he reads some of his poems. And that has already, I believe, been posted on uh, YouTube. On YouTube? So, oh, that's yes. awesome. We'll definitely look out for that. Well, well, thank Naomi, you so it's, much. Oh, it's been a treat to talk with you and just to continue to see um, your wonderful works and reaching out into the world, uh, a world of uncertainty, but with your beautiful art, we can always stay encouraged and feel comforted and as well hopeful. And so thank you for joining me on Nerdocity oh. today, Naomi. Thank you so much. That's so beautiful what you said. I'm honored to be with you. Take well, care. Peace to everybody. Thank you. Be well. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. And you were just listening to episode 42 of Nerdocity Podcast featuring my guest, award-winning poet, children's author, writer, professor, and young people's poet laureate, Naomi Shihab Nye. 
visit Naomi's websites and follow her on Instagram and Twitter. You can also pick up a copy of her book, The Turtle of Michigan, the companion story to the award-winning young reader's title, The Turtle of Oman. Thank you so much for your support for Nerdocity Podcast. If you wish to support future episodes, stop by the website and visit anchor.fm slash doawafraser slash support or by sending your donation to paypal.me slash doawaworld. I hope you'll follow Nerdocity on Instagram at Nerdocity Podcast or on Twitter. You can tweet me about this episode and other comments at Nerdocity Pod One. We also have a Facebook page for Nerdocity with Do Awa, and that is Nerdocity Podcast on Facebook. Thanks so much for listening. Take care.